So we're coming back now with the, uh, continue with the SDLC. So this principle applies to commercially available software too. And this is sometimes referred to as COTS or commercial off the shelf software COTS. Uh, and, and it also would apply to any open source software that you might be utilizing like Linux. So the primary difference is that the development isn't done in house, right? Cause it's commercially purchased or uh, open source. So only stable tested software releases should be deployed on production servers uh, to protect data availability and data integrity that we've been talking about through CIA. So the operating system and any application updates should not be deployed until they have been thoroughly tested. So I usually test in a, a developmental environment called dev, then a, a user acceptance testing which simulates production environment. And then once I go to production, I still uh, make sure that I monitor it for uh, changes uh, or problems in its first couple of days. Because the uh, failures can be spectacular. And I just list some examples of software failures that have been catastrophic. Uh, NASA's uh, Mars Climate Orbiter, right, uh, happened in 1998. Uh, and it was ultimately lost in space as a result of a uh, software uh, failure by the software engineers, right? It was revealed uh, that the team failed to make a simple conversion from English units to metrics, cost $125 million, for example, uh, and, and the list goes on. The uh, Therac 25, this was a computer controlled radiation therapy ma machine uh, that was used in hospitals and it overdosed radiation to patients based on a software error. And uh, it was really a lack of due diligence uh, to resolve the reported software bugs, which is a shame. The Ariane 5 flight, um, that was Europe's newest unmanned satellite launching rocket. Uh, which reused working software from its predecessor, but they were uh, it, uh, the Ariane 5's faster engine actually exploited a bug that wasn't found in the previous version. Uh, and frankly, it was a, an $8 billion development carrying a $500 million payload uh, that failed. And of course, then Intel's Pentium uh, fault is another example cost $475 million. You can go online and search that yourself. Here's a whole list of other spectacular software failures. The list goes on quite a while. I'm only trying to make the point um, that, uh, you know, we could add Colonial Pipeline to that now as a recent um, uh, failure that allowed hackers to uh, get to the place where they uh, could uh, manage and uh, harm our systems that rely on all the software. So um, software re releases can come in various forms as we're testing software. There's the uh, alpha phase, for example, which is the initial release after software testing. Um, uh, open source software in particular um, has this publicly available alpha versions. Um, then you can do a beta version, which is going to indicate the software features are complete. And it's and the focus here then is on usability testing or UAT. There's a release candidate, which is a hybrid of a beta and the final version. And there's the go live or generally available version for software uh, that you can uh, use along the way. Okay, so uh, uh, software updates. Uh, are done often. Uh, it's it, during its supported lifetime, right? These updates are going to be required both to operating systems and applications. And updates are different from security patches, right? So security patches are meant to address the specific vulnerability and are applied according with the patch management policy that you would uh, also probably be writing to. As opposed, software updates generally include functional enhancements and new features, right? And updates should be subject to the organization's change management process. 
and should be thoroughly tested. So those are things, configuration management, change management, and the various testing levels like DEV, UAT, uh, prior to production. Even having a peer review, so quality assurance becomes part of this process. Also, when you're updating uh, software, you always want to make sure through the change management process that you have a rollback strategy to return to the previous stable state in case problems occur. Even though I've tested it in UAT, which is a near production environment, I have had rollouts that in production didn't work and I had to roll back. We can never interrupt the business. The business is always uh, first. Um, and um, Okay, so then uh, I wanted to mention the testing environment. So in a worst case scenario, we have production servers that can double as test servers, right? That's not where I want to be. I do not want to test in production, but sometimes it has to be. In a best case scenario, I want to have that mirror image of the production environment. I would call that a UAT environment. Uh, a cost-benefit analysis uh, it should take into consideration the probability and association costs of downtime, data loss, and integrity based on which uh, uh, environment you want to use. So in a test environment, then you also want to say to yourself, in a UAT or dev environment, do I want to have dummy data or do I want to have live production data? And then if I'm using vendors to evaluate their software system, then I want to consider further what sort of a evaluation agreement do I need because I'm using my live data and we want to make sure that we protect the data along the way. Data privacy in Europe, uh, complying with uh, GDPR in America, any number of state laws like CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Now, moving to secure coding in our last couple of uh, slides together, the two types of code uh, are insecure code, right? And sometimes we call this sloppy code, uh, insecure code, right? So insecure code is the result of not focusing, lack of detail, amateurish effort, right? But more often than not, it, it really just reflects a flawed process. Where secure code, however, is always the result of a deliberate process that prioritize security from the beginning of the design phase and on. So uh, the OWASP, or Open Web Application Security Project, is an important piece of this. So deploying code uh, securely is the responsibility of the system owner, right? We've talked about the system owner, the data owner, the system, the data custodian, right? So the system owner, is responsible for deploying the secure code. And so there are a number of secure coding resources that we can use, such as OWASP, that Open Web Application Security Project, right? And it's basically an open community that is dedicated to ensuring organizations develop, purchase, and maintain applications that can be trusted, right? And so uh, OWASP releases regularly a top 10 list, and that represents a broad consensus about what are the most critical web application security flaws that should be addressed. The book on page 308 gives a list A through 10 of the OWASP top 10 from back in 2013. It includes uh, injection, uh, broken authentication and session management, cross-site scripting, uh, insecure direct object reference, in, uh, security misconfiguration, sensitive data exposure, missing function level control, cross-site request forgery, using component with known vulnerabilities, and unvalidated redirects and forwards. Anyhow, you can go to www.owasp.org and review the current top 10 list, right? along the way. Uh, the secure coding continued. There are just some final examples given uh, that uh, OWASP would be referring to. So for example, input validation is a process of validating all the inputs to an application before you use it. This would include like syntax, 
length, characters, ranges, passwords are common for this. Or what if you had a field in your application that required zip codes? You wouldn't want 12 characters or dashes or stars, right? That could be used for other uh, uh, access, right? Uh, you want to catch errors and manage it with your application. Uh, and you uh, even want to whitelist uh, any, po any positive validation. That can also be part, uh, part of it. So why do you even bother? You know, we say to ourselves, well, hackers care. Hackers are trying to, pa uh, to pass code in fields to see how the database will react, right? They want to see if they can bring down your application that you've designed or purchased. Uh, for example, like in a DOS attack, right? against the application. So to bring it down, uh, maybe even where the re server uh, uh, resides or a group of servers, right? And so they may want to run code on the target server to try and manipulate or publish sensitive data. Uh, another one is um, dynamic data verification. And so many application systems are designed to rely on outside parameter uh, tables for dynamic data. So dynamic data is defined as data that changes as updates become available, right? So for example, uh, if I load in my zip code, it may automatically calculate the sales tax based on that zip code and the current tax law. So the process of checking that the sales tax rate entered is indeed the one that matches the state uh, entered uh, is, is a form of input validation. So we want to do dynamic data verification. So an example, uh, a simple example of this also is maybe the exchange rate for a particular currency. I can also do output validation, which is the process of validating uh, before something is provided to the recipient, right? So and as an example, uh, would be substituting an asterisk for numbers on a credit card receipt, right? The output validation controls what information is going to be exposed. So hackers look for cr clues and then use this information as part of their footprinting process, as, as part of the attack, right? Which is covered in the vulnerability uh, management class, footprinting. So, uh, uh, so they may be familiar, for example, uh, and, and they are looking to learn that a certain application is vulnerable maybe to a SQL injection attack or to a buffer overflow attack, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the answer is an application that gives an error, right? That is, it, it can be a potential pointer that can lead to a vulnerability. And a hacker is gonna try and, and make that application talk to uh, better, customize the attack, talk to them. So uh, we want to be, uh, to manage those, uh, those outputs and validate them, right? Developers also test applications along the way by feeding erroneous data into the interface to see how it react, reacts. We often call that fuzzing. And then finally, I just wanted to mention um, broken authentication and session management. So uh, in that 2013 OWASP list we talked about, uh, they, um, the, uh, the, a couple of the top items were broken off and session management, right? And so uh, the session can be hijacked or taken over by a malicious intruder. So we get this man in the middle attack. So when authentic authentication controls are stored or transmitted in clear text, or even credentials can be guessed, right? How many of us have a, a password that is password, right? The identity of this authorized user can then be impersonated. So if session IDs are exposed in the URL, for example, or if they don't time out, or if they're not validated after successful log off, or invalidated rather, after a successful log off, uh, malicious people uh, can have the opportunity to continue this authenticated session. And uh, so they're acting like us. So a critical security design requirement has to be strong authentication, even multi-factor authentication, 
uh, and session management controls, right? A common control for protecting authentication credentials and session IDs is encryption, which is part of the cryptography conversation. Okay, I enjoyed it. A good conversation. I will see you all online.